As the benevolent dictators of the Republic of Bad Cryptopia, Travis and I care very much about our citizens. We love you. And because we've listened to you, you're going to discover a format change in this episode. You're going to meet blockchain strategist Jeremy Gardner in what is sure to be a super cool and interesting interview. The Trump administration is banning a certain crypto from U.S. citizens, but which one? And while traditional banks are embroiled in controversy, CEOs of these companies continue to get paid more. Huh. Well, we've got that and your questions in this John McAfee Says We're Badasses, episode number 101 of the Bad Crypto Podcast. Hey, Mr. Joel Com. Yes, sir. You are a badass. That you know what? I've heard that. Man, that episode with John was just what a what a show. What a way to hit number one hundred, huh? You know, um, that was a bad crypto gasm. That uh, episode <laughs> number one hundred one, right there. That was uh, that. You know what? We uh, we hit one hundred with a bang, and now with one hundred one, we're going to flip the switch a little bit, right? Yeah, you know what we've discovered is that a lot of the content that we have in our feature segments is stuff that is evergreen, whereas the news that we typically do earlier in the show gets dated. And so, by your request, folks, we are flipping it, and we're going to go ahead and start doing the feature segment, uh, the interviews or the teaching first in the show. That way you can get right into that meaty part. And then after the feature, we're going to get to your questions and comments and to the news. So with that, let's do our feature interview with Jeremy Gardner. Mr. Travis Wright, we recently had the opportunity to be judges and hosts of an ICO pitch at an event in South by Southwest. And while we were there, one of the panelists uh, really stood out to us primarily because he looks like he just got out of high school and because he had the best questions on the panel. Uh, That was a good time, wasn't it? That was awesome. Yeah. Nobody had better questions than Jeremy Gardner, I can assure you. Yeah, very well. <laughs> they were Nobody huge had a questions. Worse time than me either. <laughs> <laughs> was that the long? That was so long. I was like, "Are we done yet? Are we done? Or is there more people coming? How many people are coming?" I well, want to know. I announced my retirement from ICO pitch competitions, from judging them at least. Uh, oh, yeah. After that one, it was aren't bad. you glad I grabbed the mic for that deal right there? That was that could have gone on for for hours. I think it was the best thing I did. Still be there waiting. This is Jeremy Gardner. Jeremy uh, is a two-time college dropout, and he is uh, – are you the founder of Awesome Ventures? Is that your blockchain I'm fund? Co-founder. Co-founder of Awesome Ventures, an awesome blockchain fund, and it's spelled A-U-S-U-M, um, and the website is A-U-S-U-M dot V-C, and uh, we're glad that you popped in to join us today, Jeremy. Welcome to Bad Crypto. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. How did you get started in the crypto space? Take us, set the time machine. You know, you're 26 now. How old were you and what happened? Sure. So I've got, I've got the one minute, two minute, 10 minute and like 10 hour long version of my uh, journey through crypto. We'll stick to the two to three minute version. Yeah. Give us a reader's digest. Most interesting points. Sure. So I first discovered or learned about Bitcoin when reading about the Silk Road and Rolling Stone magazine in 2011. I thought the Silk Road was fascinating. I read about Bitcoin and I was like, well, this is stupid. And so never really actually learned more than that. And I never ventured onto the Silk Road as a result. And it would only be in the fall of 2013, during the first real run-up, where the world's attention kind of came to to Bitcoin for the first time, did I buy some Bitcoin. And I bought it at around $200.00. And then it went up to 1000 I was like, oh, this is just some crazy pump and dump. This is unsustainable. And I sold all around $1,000. Uh, and I thought at that time, you know, this Bitcoin thing is good for buying drugs off the internet and for rampant speculation. And it would only be in the winter, a few months later of 2014, when I transferred to the University of Michigan, having become really disillusioned with, with the world of politics, which I thought I was going into that I would happen to move in with a young Bitcoin entrepreneur that convinced me to learn about the tech. And 
due to living this with this guy, he convinced me to join the University of Michigan Bitcoin Club. And at the very first Bitcoin Club meetup, I learned that there were Bitcoin clubs at MIT and Stanford. And the politician in me was activated. I saw an organizing opportunity, got on a call with the heads of the Bitcoin clubs. And a month later, what is now known as the Blockchain Education Network was born. At the time, I didn't think much would come of it. I thought maybe we would have a dozen Bitcoin clubs around the U.S. by the end of the semester. But then Mount Gox imploded and almost everyone in the world at least heard about Bitcoin. You know, 5% of or more than 5% of all the Bitcoin in circulation disappeared. And to much of the world, it meant that Bitcoin was dead. But to young people, it brought their attention to this incredible technology. And it was actually a godsend for my organization in that by the end of the semester, we had over 100 chapters in 20 plus countries on every habitable continent. And then through uh, that nonprofit, I met Joey Krug, who is this brilliant 18-year-old computer scientist. And we went on to drop out of school and found what would become Augur, which was uh, the first ICO on top of Ethereum, one of the first ICOs ever, first utility token, if you will. And uh, after that ICO, I went and joined Blockchain Capital as an entrepreneur in residence, ended up becoming an investor there as well, found a distributed magazine which is a 108-page primer on blockchain technology. And I started a new software company called Sava, which is a legacy database security company. Can and I just say, Travis, the one quote that I just love there is, we went on to drop out of college. That's, <laughs> I mean, it's just so upside down from the way the world thinks. And I get it because college was pretty much worthless for me except for a party. But we, we, we decided, eh, we're not going to do that. We're going to do this. This college well, thing just ain't so for me. I, I just actually gave a lecture at the University of Michigan where I dropped out of. And I really wanted, I was only there for like 12 hours in Ann Arbor. And it was unfortunate because I actually wanted to go and visit the dean of the Honors College because she was the one that encouraged me to drop out for the first time in her career. She was like, I love what you have going on with your nonprofit. I love this startup stuff that you're doing, you know. You're probably going to regret this if you try to stay in school and have to sacrifice what you're building. And so she told me to drop out. And my dad was a college is a college professor. My parents never saw me graduate from high school. So like I they were not thrilled. But because of this dean at Michigan, I, I actually went and pursued what became this incredible career. So um, I'm actually incredibly grateful. And I learned a lot when I was in school because I developed my own major in political strategy which is a lot of fun. And I actually apply a lot of what I learned in college every day because I use social psychology and game theory, which were major components of my studies and are huge parts of this new crypto economy. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating considering that you're 26 years old and you just rattled off like all of these things that you've that you've done. And it's, and it's almost like, wow, that was pretty amazing. So thanks for coming on the show. That's pretty much a whole show. <laughs> you know what it is? Travis, he's drinking smart water. It doesn't make me. It doesn't make me any smarter. But I guess it's working for him. Yeah, that's great. So, so what is what is uh, you know taking up most of your time right now? So you're doing this, is the awesome the awesome VC. That's what's uh, that's what you were working on most of the time now. Yeah, the, that that is my primary focus right now. Uh, I've been doing the first close on the fund. We're going to raise somewhere. Our base target's fifty million dollars, but we may raise as much as seventy five. And it's a venture fund, not a hedge fund like these 200 new funds out there. It's, well, it's a hybrid venture hedge fund. But its structure is much different than much of what you see in the ecosystem. And so fundraising for it's a little bit more difficult. Uh, the lockup is longer. But in my view, the, the whole concept of a hedge fund in this space is so ridiculous because what are you going to hedge with? Uh, when Bitcoin goes down 50%. Guess what else goes down even more? Everything. Everything. <laughs> so, so the, the whole this whole concept of these crypto hedge funds are ridiculous to me. Uh, so I've I've got this hybrid uh, crypto asset hedge fund or, or hybrid venture hedge fund, uh, but that takes a lot of time. Just fundraising, getting the money in the bag. You know, you have to go out and, and get people to commit, and then you actually have to get people to go and sign contracts, and then actually go send the money. And so that's been, you know, the past month of my life, two months uh, going in fundraising. But the second half may not be as hard as we're speaking to large, several large institutions that may just write us a big check. I don't I, 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 I've never lost anyone money in my life. 
So I'm very careful about having the right relationship surrounding me and ensuring that everyone I work with is kind of like a strategic partner, if you will. Well, in this fund, you know, it's very clear that you're all about using startups and crypto for social good, right? right. Because there's a lot of crap going on out there. We're, like so- the, we're the first impact fund in, in the entire industry, in my view. We yeah, are, give, give an overview of that. Uh, put some sure. uh, meat on it. So this is my thesis. I mean, I, I came into this ecosystem and I came into this industry not sure of where this technology was going, but I was convinced that it, Bitcoin, at least, was this extraordinary tool for financial empowerment. And as this whole blockchain economy blossomed, you know, the rise of Ethereum, decentralized applications, I truly became convinced that this technology is the greatest disintermediator that has ever existed in human history. Like This is a way to remove middlemen from almost every single process. And that's, I mean, that is game changing and, and, and can make the lives of people better in so many different ways, whether it's from distributed identity to making supply chains more transparent uh, to making the grid, energy grid more efficient. However, Well, I'd say that's like 60 to 70 percent of use cases for blockchain technology, use cases that make the world better, more efficient, more transparent, uh, more equal. There's probably 20 to 30 percent that, you know, they're the decentralized casinos, the the tools that make ExxonMobil supply chain better, the pump and dumps, you know. Well, and that's kind of excusing just the total crap coins out there. But if you excuse those, you know, I think most blockchain technology makes the world better, but we will never make an investment if we don't believe it will. And so and because we're a venture fund, we can give our investments a seven year time horizon. You know, they don't need to make the world better tomorrow. But if they're successful in seven to 10 years, you know, we expect them to have really dramatically improved the world. Yeah, blockchain. You know, that's one of the things that uh, that you've not have, have united Joel and I. You know, we're we're in the marketing space. I'm a marketing technologist. Joel's a, a, a you know top marketer for. He's been in the space 20 years. Written written 15 books. But it was blockchain. Blockchain. It wasn't crypto that really that really snagged me because I I mined crypto back in 2010. You know, I I had a you know I set up my computer and boom I mined a block I got 50 bitcoin wow that was cool but damn my fan is running hot I'm shutting this off that's this is stupid and uh and then my computer crashed and then I ended up throwing that computer away and I ended up losing x amount of bitcoin uh and so I I I'd heard about bitcoin multiple times but it never really hit me until blockchain smacked me upside the head and then I was like ah I get it I mean this is like this is like a whole new way to exchange wealth. I mean, this is a whole new way of exchange. This is a once once people get it, they get it. And uh, so, what what is what is your thoughts about blockchain, and what what would you suggest for people to help them get it? So the way I best articulate it is, if you think about the World Wide Web since the dawn of the internet. We've pretty much had this extraordinary tool for the uploading, exchange, and dissemination of information in often a peer-to-peer way. You, you can send files and you can send information in a very frictionless manner. Email is a great example of that. However, if you want to exchange value online, whether that value is your money the title or deed to your house or car, your intellectual property or the rights to your music, you still have to rely on the same centralized legacy institutions that have existed for decades or even centuries, such as banks, governments, centralized repositories and clearinghouses for the exchange of that value. Now, while using something like Venmo may make that exchange of value feel frictionless, in the back end, there's a bunch of paper getting pushed and the clearing times take days. There's no way to exchange value as easily as or as you can send an email. But that's what Bitcoin and blockchain technology is it, it enable is the frictionless peer-to-peer transaction of value between any individual in the world with an internet connection. And if you think about how value drives human society, everything we do has to do with the exchange of value in one manner or another. Then you begin to realize how revolutionary blockchain technology, in fact, is. 
Mm. That that's getting closer, Travis, to that fifth grade explanation that I've been looking for. Because yeah, even after doing the show for what are we nine months now, I still struggle to to you know distill it down to its simplest terms, and I, I like that. Um, so education is super important to you, and you, along with uh, Jinglin Wang, who is uh, going to be a guest on the show soon as well, you you two have started the Blockchain Education Network. It's a 501c3 nonprofit. Tell us about that. Yeah, so Jing's amazing. Uh, it started right when I got into the ecosystem. I, I learned about these Bitcoin clubs. I was like, let's organize. And so we started this grassroots collection of young people. And the whole concept here is to bring all the young people in the world that are enthusiastic about this tech or just want to learn about it together, allow them to start their own student organizations at their universities or high schools around the world and educate each other, focus on whatever excites them, whether that's entrepreneurship, trading, uh, advocacy, academic research, it doesn't matter. And, 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 and it gives them the connections and the resources to get started and meet other like-minded students around the world. We provide uh, tickets to hackathon, uh, hackathons and conferences. We host our own hackathons and bro- provide the resources for that. And what Jing has done this extraordinary job of doing is starting to create real edu- educational materials and courses. So she's working with Vlad Zamfir, who's developing Casper, or proof of stake for Ethereum, and creating a MOOC for that. She's going to go work with IPFS and other organizations, uh, probably ZeroX, and help young people go and learn how to develop on top of these really game-changing platforms. Have you already seen the fruit of that, you know, as far as what's coming out of that? Sure. I mean, look at, like, the, 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 on the founding teams of Quantum, which is a multi-billion dollar blockchain, IOTA, uh, Augur, uh the CEO of Coinless, there's another company called Bolt. Those are all those all those teams all have uh, founding team members that came from the Blockchain Education Network, mm. and there are countless more as well. There's one another team called Distributed ID, and they're in TechStars right now. Zendit was a Y Combinator company now based out in Indonesia. And they came out of our first uh, hackathon over at UC Berkeley. It's been extraordinary. I mean, we're talking about billions of dollars of enterprise value. I've come out of this nonprofit in, you know, three and a half years, four years. That's great. Yeah, that's 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 an unbelievable accomplishment. Uh, you know, I mean, regardless of how old you are, you at age fifty, that's just badass. Here you are at half of that. You know what I mean? Well, I, 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 it is not really my doing. What it is is the fact that we have this incredible technology, and it forces self organization. And all you need to do is go and create the basic parameters infrastructure for people to build around this tech, and they come. Mm. And, and, and I think we often, as an industry, overvalue the, the technical side of things while diminishing the community and, and business development side of things, which allowed everyone to come together and actually build something. Otherwise, we get left with a bunch of science experiments. That's uh, I love you. I love your humility, Jeremy. I mean, that's whenever anybody, whenever anybody puts the you know spotlight on somebody, and you go, "Hey, it's not really me." Um, I think that's just really great awareness, especially you know as young as you are. And I applaud that. So well, you can be you can be proud of that humility. Well, the, fact, the fact is, is like I'm like not the brightest guy in the room ever in crypto, and I love that. Like I'm always surrounded with by people that are smarter than me. The one thing I'm good at doing is just organizing people and bringing them together. And then it's really people like Jing and like Joey over at Augur, my co-founder at uh, Awesome, Barbara, who actually go and get done. You need you need those people. Like uh, I'm just kind of a cheerleader, <laughs> which, which, which I found is actually an important role, but it, it, it can often be overplayed. And, you know, I, I, I definitely don't deserve as nearly as much credit as I've gotten historically. No, that's great. It sounds like you're great at really being able to connect and bring people together and uh, work. But you put on some pretty good projects. So, so tell us a little bit about Augur, right? This is this is one of the very first um, you know projects that was launched on Ethereum, and you know that's Ethereum. Everyone knows it's huge. Augur is it's it's had some pretty big popularity. It looks like you guys have what? There's 11 million or so circulating of your tokens out there. You guys have had you guys had reached. $1.1 billion in market cap in this last run up. So this is not a small token. Uh, you know, tell folks about Augur and who's running Augur's day to day. 
Sure. So Augur is a decentralized prediction market platform. Effectively, it's an unstoppable online betting platform that predicts the future. And it's just like a stock market, but instead of buying and selling shares in what you believe the future value of a company will be, you're buying and selling shares in the future outcome of an event. That event can be a sports match, a political uh, election, a uh, geopolitical event, some uh, climatological forecast, uh, celebrity, the, the outcome of a celebrity marriage. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. It, it's, it, it turns kind of anything that occurs in the future into a stock market. And what you do is you go and usually buy yes and no shares. Uh, the example I usually give is, will Donald Trump be uh, impeached by 2019? And people can buy yes shares, people can buy no shares. Let's say more people believe he won't be impeached. It may be 60 cents for the no shares and correspondingly 60, uh, 40 cents for the yes shares. And what you can understand from uh, that price per share is the probability that the market assigns of the event occurring. So if, it, 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 if it's 60 cents for a no share, that means the market assigns a 60% probability of him not being impeached. And the reason why this works is due to a theory known as the wisdom of crowds. And, and the wisdom of crowds posits that if you have enough people betting on what, was, what is going to happen in the future, none of them exactly have to be right, but especially when buttressed by putting their money with where their mouth is, they're actually going to land on what is close to the right probability. And, and, and most social scientists would agree and economists would agree that prediction markets are, in fact, one of the best ways humanity has of predicting the future. But because it looks like, you know, highly regulated activity, which is betting or stock markets or gambling, uh, that are highly regulated. And it's been very difficult to create a global prediction market platform. Mm -hmm. And so at Augur in late 2014, we stumbled upon a white paper for decentralized prediction market platform. And this was in the first kind of decentralization wave where everyone was like, decentralize all the things. And I was like, this is kind of stupid. But I saw decentralized prediction markets and having used prediction markets when I was in high school and college that ended up getting shut down, I really saw this powerful use case for the tech and blockchain technology. We first tried to build on top of Bitcoin, but soon realized that wouldn't work. And Vitalik at that time was already an advisor to us because he loved prediction markets. And he actually reached out, despite Ethereum being nine months away from launching, and suggested that we try building on top of Ethereum, which we then ended up doing. And the mainnet should be launching within the next month, and then afterwards, the, the product should go fully live within a half year. So without taking sides, what does the market, the wisdom of crowds, say about Trump being impeached? So, so because Augur isn't live yet, we couldn't rely on that. We could go to predict it. I mean, I, I actually usually say 60% yes, but I realized I kind of wanted to be accurate. I mean, as, as we're like a third of the way into 2018, I don't think Trump's getting impeached, uh, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, well, let, me, let, me, let me ask you this then. You've got a place called the Crypto Castle in San Francisco. Are you there now? Are you in the Crypto no, Castle? I'm down, I'm down in Santa Monica, but it, that okay. is my home. So what is the Crypto Castle and what do you do there? So when we started Augur, we moved up to, uh, to San Francisco. And at first, we, we really had no money. So we ended up moving into this dingy two-bedroom apartment in South San Francisco that hosted about six of us. We called it the Bitcoin Basement. I just love alliteration. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 so so I, I use alliteration in all my names. You're the Jeremy and jokester. Yeah, exactly. And the name of the nonprofit between Augur is the Forecast Foundation. Anyhow, uh, we had the Bitcoin basement and then we raised a bit of money. And at this time, this was at the tail end of 2014, we had spent a little bit of time in San Francisco and I was going to the meetups. But I was looking at the kind of crypto culture in SF and the Bay Area. It was really lacking. There was no there was no places or hubs where people would go and hang out and shoot the shit late at night you know we would go to the bars after the meetups but there was no cultural hub and so i really wanted that and so we raised some money i ended up finding this house and it's just a house a three-story townhouse in uh san francisco that you know it's otherwise 
fairly unremarkable, but the third floor is on this hill. Well, the house is on this hill. And on the third floor is just this sweeping view from the top of the hill overlooking all of San Francisco and the Bay. And it feels very castle-like. Uh, and, and it's this great hub for hosting people because it's an open layout on the third floor. And, you know, I just called it the Crypto Castle. Didn't really think much of it. But then a couple of articles got written and it just became this like cultural landmark. And now I can't ever move out. <laughs> well, that's so and great. now people come visit you and knock on the door. And so we'll be dropping in next time we're in San Francisco. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, and we've shot like CNBC has shot live out of there. We've done photo shoots with like Forbes and Business Insider. We, we have film crews there once a month at least. Awesome. Uh, so we're always happy to host. But yeah, I had to get a doormat and it says Crypto Castle. And the first rule on this is, no strangers. The second one um, is no trading. And the third one is hodl. Mm. <laughs> and what's so funny is it's just a regular house, but since it's in San Francisco, it's priced like a castle. No, it's not. So for the people that live in it, the most anyone pays is about fourteen hundred dollars. Which if you're in like oh Midwest, yeah, nice. that's not bad at all. There, wow. But the average one bedroom in San Francisco is forty five hundred dollars. So the, the people, so the, the people living in my house pay less than almost anyone else in San Francisco. That's insane. Forty five hundred for one bedroom. Good grief. That's got to change. Yeah. yeah. How many people live in in the crypto castle? So officially, well, my landlord's not going to listen. To that. <laughs> Un- unofficially, <laughs> no, we have four. But we'll have anywhere from seven to ten. Uh, you know, we've got a guest bedroom with two bunk beds in it. You know, we've hosted like Peter Tog, Vitalik, uh, Vlad Zamper. We've had all these core developers. We've had all sorts of entrepreneurs. Uh, we were all we all we had a self-driving car startup found in our basement called Comma AI by the famous hacker George Hot. Sorry, Geo Hot. That's so great. So what's what's next on the next on the uh, on the roadmap for you? So I just I just hit five cities in five days. So I'm gonna hang out down here in Santa Monica for a, a few days, get some work done. But then it's it's about launching this fund. I mean, we've already got a few fantastic investments that I've managed to line up despite not having any ba- money in our bank account. Uh, the, the the entrepreneurs liked us enough to give us some allocation. I got I got to go send those guys some wires now. And then it's just going and working with these entrepreneurs that I've invested in recently and in the past that we may want to invest in with the fund and, you know, making this blockchain economy real. For the most part, blockchains are not real. I mean, Bitcoin is a cool digital gold. But beyond that, like this technology has not become tangible beyond a handful of enterprise use cases that none of us are really exposed to. And so really ensuring that the entrepreneurs building real world use cases have the resources they need, which usually extends far beyond money, is is my main priority. But then I'm also starting a canned water company probably. Oh, awesome. Well I've heard that boxed water is better. You know, you got the bottle, uh, you got the box. They're still cutting down trees. Aluminum is the least uh wasteful form of prepackaged water. Now all packaged water is bad in my view, because some places mandate it and some people demand it. Uh you have to have an option. But, alum- but aluminum is actually the best way to package water. The problem is, is that people, I learned, the reason why they don't do this already and cannot like everything else is people like to be able to see their water mm-hmm. and thus are willing to destroy the oceans and the planet. Uh, what about able- what about hemp plastic? I think that's one of the uh, – I've always thought that, uh, that hemp is such an underutilized resource. You can make 50,000 products from hemp. And the plastics that can be made from the hemp seed oil, uh, actually, Henry Ford invented an engine that ran off of it. He made a whole car, essentially, that was made out of hemp. Uh, and that's when the legislation came down back in the day. But I would look into hemp hemp plastic. I mean, because it, it, then it's biodegradable. It's biodegradable very, you know, very quickly. It's not harmful to the environment. And uh, everything that's made out of hemp can be recycled back into hemp paper, which is crazy. It, I may be wrong, but I, I feel like we're we don't have nearly enough manufacturing capacity for hemp today because of the federal legislation that surrounds uh, the plant. Is that incorrect? Mm, I, I believe so. Yeah, that's one of those that's things. It's like correct. for to yeah, me. So, so I, like, you know, I got out of politics. I, yeah. like, like, <laughs> Good for you. No, that's Good so, for I'll, you. Uh, I'll pay so, someone to go lobby Congress to make hemp legal, but like 
look, we need solutions now. I mean, for sure, ninety percent of all plastic water. This study came out a few days ago. Ninety percent of all plastic water, like smart water or uh, a Dasani, has microplastics in it. It has plastics because all the water in the world is contaminated. Yeah. It's insane. Call me Plastic Man. Which is why I use one of these right here. We we fill my water. I got a big jug that I refill it out of all the time. With bad crypto sticker on it. Uh, So, you know, I'm wondering, just because you mentioned water, are you involved in any clean water initiatives for third world countries and such? So I love the charity water guys. Like if I was going to give money to, and I've given money to them in the past, but like, and and they were actually one of the first nonprofit that's ever accept Bitcoin. Charity Water is definitely the org I would uh, give to simply because, you know, when you give them money, exactly where that money is going to. Uh, yeah, I'm actually to- I'm on the board of waterislife.com. And we've talked about them here before um, they, their feet on the ground that are doing uh, the same thing. And uh, without getting into that too much, did you know that the world water crisis can be solved once and for all with a billion dollars? That we now have the technology that there are um, there's a manufacturer actually here in Colorado um, that uh, it's called uh, Sun. I can't remember the name. I just drew a blank, but it's a solar wind powered device that um, can generate clean water for entire large communities. And they ran the math on it, how, what it would take to put these in all the places where there's filthy unpotable water in a billion dollars solves it once and for all. I think it's a scale thing. It's, it's probably getting the manufacturing to scale. Probably one of those it devices is. takes a month to the manufacture and you probably need thousands of them or something. You, you, you do know? need thousands. Well, I, we appreciate your time, Jeremy. I know you've got to go uh, run and do some wire transfers, but before we do one, one last question. Well, no wire part. transfers uh, pass, uh, well, for the past four hours, I mean, welcome to old world banking. Come on. Uh, right, 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 right. I know, it's crazy. <laughs> so uh, the, the previous episode was with John McAfee, and you know his predictions about Bitcoin. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, a two, two-part question. What do you think has happened right now with, you know, the big pullback? And where do you see Bitcoin going? And let's just keep short term, December 31st, 2018. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm no good for predicting the price, although I did predict this pullback. I, 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 you can Every interview I've done for the past four months, I've said this market is insane, this is frothy, and it needs to correct. I'm glad it happened as soon as it did. I did not want it going up any further. These oils and crash would have been a lot uglier. And I think we actually have a lot more correcting to do. I think there's a lot of crap tokens out there that need to disappear. So I wouldn't be surprised if this market shook out even further. I, I don't have good price predictions for a year from now. I think Bitcoin could be at $1,000 or it could be at $50,000. I don't think it could be too much in either direction beyond that, but those are, those are yeah. uh, it's kind of a big That's a nice buffer there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's so many macroeconomic factors at play. Yeah. Global geopolitical instability is, is a very real thing that is not being accounted into the crypto market or even the macroeconomic markets. If you look at the stock markets today, they're not taking into account the just global instability that is occurring politically in nation states on every continent. And that is deeply troubling to me. But trust me, when there's geopolitical instability and that really flares up, I'd much rather have my money in crypto than I would have in the stock markets. I I took all my money out of the stock markets about nine months ago, and it was probably a bit premature considering they kept on going up. But it's unsustainable. Uh, I, I, I think there's so the, 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 in both the crypto market and the stock markets, there are these just like massive flaws underlying these systems that need to be addressed before there's any more true growth. You know, there can always be more speculative growth. As Cain said, you know, the market can stay irrational much longer than you can stay solvent. But to see true growth in either the global macro economy or the crypto economy, we need to see a shakeout in the crap and, and, and come back to earth in our expectations of future earnings and future kind of technological potential. Because right now, crypto assets, even if the technology grows at, at an exponential pace and we get thousands of new developers or tens of thousands of new developers that start contributing to all these open source projects, still going to take years to catch up to the market caps that we see today. 
So having a real shakeout is it's totally healthy. You know, I've seen my net worth go down, you know, probably close to 70%, and I'm totally okay with that. You just got to ride it out. You know, if you're investing in this technology, you've got to do it for the long run. Mm-hmm. That's great. Great stuff. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's one of those things when you because you look at the market, the market goes up, and you're like everybody's like woo, and then I mean, like you serious? It went from, we went from two hundred and fifty million dollars on Thanksgiving to eight hundred and forty billion dollars uh, six weeks later, and that was just the most that was the craziest. Like Joel and I, those episodes that we were doing at that time, it was just it was just insane watching it go from two hundred fifty billion to eight hundred and forty billion, and then it's like it's gonna teeter, man. It's gonna and then there are so yeah, I, many. I, I, I went to East Asia for two weeks at the end of the year, and I just cut off. I was like, this is insane. It's unsustainable. And then I was on, like, this tiny ferry boat in Thailand. And the only word I can understand is Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> and it goes, so boom. Uh, Jeremy Gardner, <laughs> awesome. Really part of the zeitgeist in a way that I don't think any of us could have imagined. Oh, yeah, and- also on the horizon, I've got a TV show coming out. So yeah, that TV be- show, too. We didn't even Tell talk us. about your magazine. Got a magazine yeah, it's and a TV, TV show. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, I mean, the, the TV show, I, I've been getting pitched by, like, uh, producers for a long time. It's unscripted television, otherwise known as reality television. We got some, like, incredible names on the show, some of the biggest names in crypto uh, doing it. I'm coming on as a consulting producer. Uh, I think it has a potential to bring crypto to the mainstream. Uh, all the networks, all the, all the streaming uh, uh, websites, have all expressed strong interest in the show. Uh, we're going to shoot the pilot in the next month. Uh, it could be really exciting, kind of making Bitcoin not just a word that everyone knows, but also culturally relevant, something that people can understand. So that, that that's coming to a screen near you soon. That's great. What's it called? Now, so they wanted to call it Kings of Crypto, and I said, absolutely not. This is a global technology, and the last thing we're going to do is exclude half the world's population. So I've helped bring in some amazing women in the industry, and it, it's going to really kind of encompass the, the necessary diversity it will take to make this technology real. This is not something that can just be the, the, the domain of a couple of nerdy white dudes. It, it, it has to be something that is global, that affects minorities, the world's populations, and obviously the better half of our population. Mm-hmm nerdy crypto chicks we need nerdy black dudes and chicks we need nerdy asians we 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 need nerdy muslims we want all the nerds like yeah. nerds of the world unite under this that is it this thing all the blockchain. that's happening there it is well the and then blockchain. we need the non-nerds to actually use it i mean and right. and, and, sure. and that's the point of the show is to make this something that everybody gets absolutely uh jeremy thanks so much the website again awesome.vc not spelled the way you would spell because we don't do that anymore we spell things differently a u s u m dot v c thanks a lot man and it means daring or enterprising in latin so very good perfect great stuff man best of luck to you man this is good stuff great interview there with jeremy gardner now jeremy's a really interesting guy we we met him at south by southwest he was uh, on a panel with us there uh, at the uh, the Crypto Friends Crypto Summit thing where we were um, judging all these different ICOs. A really smart guy. He had the best questions, Mr. Joel Com. He did have the best questions. Uh, I, you know, I don't want to say he dominated the judges panel, but he kind of dominated the judges panel. And, you know, everybody else was like, uh, I don't want to ask questions because Jeremy's are so good. They did. Uh, uh, that was great. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Well, I think if the, if there was a judging competition, then he won that. Jeremy, you are hereby dubbed King of Judgy McJudgy Pantsville. Nice. Nice. That's a place. Say, it's, it's right next door to uh, Bad Cryptopia, I think. <laughs> it is now. All right. Well, you know what? We've got questions from you guys, and uh, we've got answers from us. Bad Crypto Inbox. You've got mail. And John writes us from Canada, A, eh? and he says, I'm John from Canada, A. Eh? When you want to do a website, first you have to buy domain names to secure your name before development, and there's a ton of places to go. Where do you go to register or reserve your coin name or trade symbol? If you wanted to start creating a coin, development takes time. It would be frustrating to take some years and, oh, crap, someone else launched a coin with the same name before you. Stay bad. Um, the Great question and uh, Travis, I know you have answers. I have answers. 
you know, I don't know that there is a place that you go and register or reserve that coin name. I know we've looked at it. There's different places. I mean, you can go to BitShares and um, snag it, or you can go to Waves platform to snag it, but I don't know where you go to snag it for Ethereum. Yeah, well, here's the thing. There was actually uh, one coin, well, two coins had used the same symbol recently, and this exact, I'm trying to remember who it was. Um, it was somebody we had on the show because they had um, re- started, u- oh, I remember now, it was INS. INS.world was, uh, was on the show for their ICO by uh, disrupting grocery um, uh, mm-hmm. purchases and distribution on blockchain. And they did a token that was like a bonus token called INSP. And there's a company that has INSP as their uh, their symbol. And so there, there was some confusion there for a little bit. And, you know, I, I think that when it gets to trading on a market, that you don't see any duplications, right? I mean, there's no, if you go to coin market cap, I don't see any duplicates of symbols there. So maybe in order to get listed, you have to have your own individual one. Yeah, great question. I don't know that there is one answer. It's not like you can go to GoDaddy and buy, you know, your uh, your coin name or your trade symbol. There's There's no service for that currently. And so that's one thing that I've always thought as well is like, what about the ones that are dead? Because there was coins out there that didn't survive. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, are the, can they revive them and utilize them later? Uh, hard to say. Uh, you know, it's one of those things when you're in such a, a beginning uh, and, and nascent industry as we are, then uh, there's a lot of things that are going to change over time. And that's kind of one of them. And maybe there'll be a service down the road. Maybe there is one. We just don't know about it because, right. you know, we are bad. Because we're bad. And there's probably somebody that's listening to this right now going, you blockchain blockheads, duh. So write us and tell us badcryptopodcast at gmail.com or go to the website at badcryptopodcast.com and click the contact us form or call us 708-885-9030 and leave us a message just like this person did. Bad crypto voicemail. You have one new message. Travis and Joel, I have a bad question that I hope you can give me a bad answer to. It's about comparing market capitalizations on coinmarketcap.com. We often talk about previous historical prices on coinmarketcap.com, and we do that by talking about the overall market cap. Some people say around you know early November 2017, it was in the 200s, high 200s, maybe even 300,000, uh, sorry, 300 billion. Um, and now today, you know, we're hovering at 284 uh, billion. And uh, I'm just wondering if the difference in the number of cryptocurrencies makes a difference. Uh, does it matter that there were only 1,300 cryptocurrencies then, but there's 1,564 now? Anyway, stay bad. Well, of course, it, it makes a difference. The more coins and tokens that are listed on coin market cap, then the the coin market um, cap in general can expand, right? There's just more opportunity for growth there. So certainly, if there's only 1,300 cryptos, you know, uh, several months ago, and now there's 1,564, as you say, then it makes sense that the overall market cap could expand on that. Yeah, like remember when... Uh Bcash was created out of thin air, and that substantially increased the market cap by several billion, right? And, uh, yeah, so anytime those new coins are coming on, uh, a lot of times, so, you know, maybe an ICO is raising $15 million. Well, that's their market cap whenever they get started. And then once it gets on the uh, on those exchanges and the, the values start going up or going down, uh, well, that, that increases the uh, their market cap. And so, you start adding several new tokens onto those, uh, into the exchanges and into the, into the market cap. Yeah. It increases over time. Although not right now, Mr. Joel Kahn, because the market cap is, is down pretty substantially. You know, what is interesting, Travis, is that Bitcoin dominance has continued to increase again. It's now at, you know, as of this recording, 44 percent. And that's, you know, I think we saw a low of about 36 or maybe even lower than that. Mm hmm. Yeah, and, and you know what is the market cap right now? As of right now, this very minute, three hundred and twenty billion, three hundred twenty-one billion dollars, and uh, we've seen this thing fluctuate. Like it's like massive days of just so much red, and then ah, huh, now the last couple of days we've seen some a little bit of green, a little bit uh, of green, a little bit of green, a little bit of red. Oh my gosh! But like you know what? If you were you know um, a trader and had <laughs> had some of this. Uh, foresight could you imagine like there's so many coins today that are up 35 
forty percent. Quantum is up forty two percent today. Like amazing. But over the last few days, they've just dropped tremendously. So a lot of uh, a lot of value has been pulled out of the altcoins, and I guess pulled back into to Bitcoin dominance. Love to hear from you guys. Write us, call us, send us smoke signals, and let's check out the latest news. It has been a lot of bear activity in the crypto markets, Travis, and, and we need some good news because those of us who have been in crypto for any amount of time understand that crypto go up, crypto go down, but we are in blockchain for the long haul because the technology is disruptive. And this story came out on CryptoSumer.com, Fundstrat. He's uh, a New York-based market research firm. Tom Lee is with Fundstrat, and he's got an incredibly bullish call on Bitcoin for the next two years, suggesting that the latest 70% drop bodes well for the future future price. He says by March 28th, 2020, that Bitcoin price could reach, get this, 91000 which is still a far cry from McAfee's million, uh, half a million, or he eats his member. Yeah, yeah. No, he said a million by the end of 2020. So uh, McAfee better hope that um, from March 28th, 2020 to December 31st, 2020, that it gains about $909,000 in value. There's a really great chart here on this article that kind of shows the the uh, lifespan of, of Bitcoin since 2010, and it annotates the different bull and bear markets. So you can kind of see the patterns here, and based on the patterns in trading, this is what he's looking at and saying uh, it's going to go bull and um, it's going to shoot up. So he may be a financial advisor. We are not. You know, that's one of those things over time. That has happened. I mean, that it, historically, this is what has occurred. So, you know what? Let's see. Um, you know what? Because right now, I mean, w- when the markets are down, you know, people, people frown. They're a little more grumpy. I mean, I've noticed there's a little, there's, there's more grumpy comments in the, in the mastermind group. I mean, people right. are not happy about it. People Don't become be grumpy, bitter people. They'll be a bitter Bitcoiner. Um, you know, and so, you know, we need some good news. And you know what? This is one of those things. It's like uh, what goes up comes down, but what goes down doesn't always stay down. It comes back up, you know. And so that's what's happened in this particular space is that uh, it's been really, really interesting. It goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. It's a roller coaster. Again, don't invest more than you can afford to lose. Uh, here's more good news, at least I think so. This article on Coindesk says that American Express may be looking into using blockchain to boost the speed of transactions. There is a patent application that was received by the USPTO, and it, it describes using tech to facilitate payments between two parties by using transaction requests as a proxy. It's a blockchain based system. So, you know, I think that that's, that's bullish news right there. Mm -hmm. I mean, seriously, how long, whenever you do a credit card transaction or a debit card transaction, or even a bank transaction with a check or whatever, I mean, who, who still uses checks? Well, the lady at the grocery store the other day did, but um, other than that, uh, not, not many, but you know, you can do the transaction and then you look at your bank and, that thing is pending for like two to three days sometimes, sometimes even longer. And I'm like, why isn't this already settled? I mean, this was like, get it done. So if that can, if that can, uh, you know, blockchain can help solve that problem, that is going to be welcome. And, you know, they won't need a token to do that. That's just something that just, you know, blockchain is going to be built in and, uh, and, uh, make that things a lot faster. And I, I think that's, you know, that's why we need blockchain. Blockchain has so many uses. I, I want to blockchain my breathing. Every time I breathe in, I get tokens. Mm-hmm. And every time I breathe out, a kitten smiles. That sounds really good. Kitten smiles coin. Yeah, I like it. Now, breathe on the coin, other breathe hand, coins. you know, whether, whether regulation is going to be a good thing or not, it remains to be seen. But we do keep our eye on uh, things that are happening around the world to see wh- which countries are taking action. And Thailand is one of those. This article on CCN.com says Thailand begins legal process to regulate and tax cryptocurrencies. This is from, uh, it looks like they got their news from the Bangkok Post. So it sounds official to me. Yeah, Bangkok Post sounds sounds legit. Well, you know what? There's more there's more countries that are regulating and trying to put forward, you know, policies that 
still encourage uh, innovation and also help regulate things that way they know you know that way people aren't avoiding taxes the way people aren't doing money laundering and they're looking for ways to to keep people safe and i think a lot of that's really good i i just get concerned whenever you know countries are looking at sort of banning them or they're regulating them in such a way that uh you know innovation is stymied and they they leave and go they go elsewhere i think i kind of sense that's what's ha- going to begin happening in america because a lot of people can't even participate in any of these ICOs anymore, and the only ones who can are the rich, and that's a big challenge. I mean, we've talked about that in the past, and it's just one of those things, Mr. Joel Com, that uh, why can't we all get along and help this thing self-regulate? And uh, there really needs to be, a, 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 you know, somebody who can help identify these uh, the the scam coins. That's what really needs to really needs to happen. But we also need to be able to be trusted with our own money. I mean, it's our money. Uh, the government takes X percentage of it anyways with taxes, whatever is left. You know, maybe the people want to invest it to uh, to see if they can get some money for their retirement. And, um, yeah, Thailand is uh, is beginning to regulate and, and tax these cryptocurrencies. And that's, you know, hopefully that works out well for them. Well, and speaking of regulating, it is looking at like it's going to happen here at home. We've got two stories around this. One of them on Coindesk says uh, an SEC official said that dozens of crypto inv- investigations are underway. A top officials confirmed the existence of numerous investigations into initial coin offering campaigns. Um, you know, we don't know what they're investigating in particular because there are a lot of crappy coins out there, but they're looking for illegal activity with a focus on token sales. Um, in, in particular, they might also be looking into simple agreements for future tokens, which are SAFTs, um, that promise to eventually distribute distributed tokens in exchange for funds. So, you know, we don't know who they're looking into, but you can rest assured that we will be covering it here at Bad Crypto when the SEC finally does drop the hammer on some of these. Uh, and also right along those lines, Mr. Joel Com. so I saw this last night, Bittrex is removing over 80 altcoins from its, its exchange and I think these are some of the ones that maybe the SEC might be looking looking after. So, you know, especially after Poloniex, they started to suffer from, you know, degraded performance, all these different coins that are on there. Uh, there's a whole lot of different ones that aren't maybe all that valuable. And so Bittrex is removing 82 different altcoins from the exchange on March 30th. And I looked at all of them, all the various different ones. And one of the ones that I was kind of, well, I thought was a little peculiar was metal, M-E-T-A-L. That was one that I thought was pretty good, but there are a ton that they are getting rid of. Yeah, I don't recognize any of these, honestly, on this list. You can go to our show notes at badco.in forward slash 101, and you can see there's things like BTA, Draco, G-E-M-Z, and a Bob is going to be disappointed because Bob coin is uh, is no longer going to be on Bitrix. So I think a little house cleaning is is a fine thing. No problem with that. What I do yeah. have a problem with or I might. I'm still I'm on the fence here. You know, we've talked in the past about the Venezuelan issued Petro cryptocurrency and how they were backing it, you know, by assets of the country that are already in disarray. Um, and the uh, Trump administration, Trump actually issued an executive order banning any transactions within the U.S. involving digital coins issued by the Venezuelan government. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, we've had lots of conversations about that Petro, and there are sanctions against Venezuela, right, because of the the dictator there, President Maduro. Yeah, so they've created roughly 100 million of these Petro tokens, uh, estimated to be worth around $6 billion, and they're saying we cannot do anything with those tokens, and uh, that's an executive order laid down by the uh, president uh, himself. Yep. So we'll see how this pans out. I wasn't planning on buying any Petro anyway, and so yeah, I'm okay with it. I'm just not sure how I feel about uh, regulation. But I oh my god, know. oh my god, Mr. Joel Com, what? Uh, Bit- Bitrix is banning Titcoin. What the <laughs> heck? That is so sad. <laughs> well, 
Good to know. Thank you for that breaking news, Mr. Travis. Uh, right? Uh, our, our I got to get, get rid of all my tits. <laughs> last news story is a tweet. Uh, actually, uh, Wells Fargo, the CEO of Wells Fargo, Tim Sloan, got a 36% pay hike in 2017, in spite of the fact that it was one of the worst years in the bank's 166-year history. And I, I don't understand that. Why give incentives when customers are unhappy? That just that makes no sense to me. Well, another thing that made no sense to me, you know, and it still doesn't, in the 2008-2009 financial crisis that was that was facilitated by many of these bankers, only one person got arrested and he was a lackey. And these these top bankers still made millions and millions of dollars in bonuses and it's continuing to this day how all of these bankers are making so much money you know, just essentially raping their customers and taking so many fees and just pull, it just, it just blows me away how the financial system has been able to do this for so long. And then they want to regulate our, our, our ability to, you know, participate in cryptocurrencies and this other stuff because they don't trust us with our own money. I don't trust these bankers with our own money because look, they only serve themselves. They don't really, they're not in it to serve us, but Wells Fargo, uh, epically, uh, you know, their their customers are upset, irate at well at Wells Fargo. And, oh, the CEO gets a 36% raise. Are you serious? Yeah, I, I think that people have a right to be upset. But, you know, they are a um, publicly traded company, and they can certainly hear from the shareholders if, if that's what, uh, you know, if they want to make their opinion known. Anyhow, hope that you guys have enjoyed this episode. This is now the call to action segment of the show. Don't leave us yet because we need you. Without you, without our listeners, without the citizens of the Republic of Bad Cryptopia, we are nothing. We're just two dudes talking crypto. And so we need your reviews. Please, 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 please. Yes, I'm begging. Mr. Travis Wright is pleading, but I'm begging. Uh, go to iTunes if you listen to us on iOS. Take just 30 seconds, look up Bad Crypto Podcast, and shoot a review up there for us. If you're not on iOS, then uh, Google Play is the is a place that you might listen. Or go to our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash bad crypto and review us there. We really do appreciate it. We do notice it. And uh, we, we say a special prayer for those of you who review us that your cryptos will go to the moon. Mm -hmm. Loving you is easy because you're beautiful. Loving you is easy do, 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 because do, do, do. you guys know how to stay bad. All new Ellen. Well, he's a gentleman in the streets and also a gentleman in the sheets. The one and only George Clooney. Like I know. No, I don't know. <laughs> I just make stuff up, but I think that's right. Ellen, today at 3 on NBC for New York. Then at 4, get 20 minutes of uninterrupted news, plus your exclusive 10-day forecast, all before the first commercial. Join Stephen Holt, Natalie Pascarella, and Dave Price for News for New York at 4 p.m. Today on NBC for New York.